Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for praying for these ones, especially these new ones. They need our prayers. They need our encouragement. They need our mentorship, our training, everything we can give them to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty work. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Let's uh, carry on in our series on growing in the grace of giving. And uh, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we're going to take a look at a few verses today, and then we're going to launch into the second message that is part of this series. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll start by just reading the first four verses, and then we'll skip to the passages that we're going to really zoom in on later on in the message. 
All right, 2 Corinthians. If you can't find it in your Bibles, always use your table of contents. It's a great little way to help you find stuff. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. For in a severe test of affliction, that doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? Their abundance of joy, well, that sounds the exact opposite. And their extreme poverty, again, that doesn't sound very good. Overflowed a wealth of generosity on their part. Isn't that just the greatest sentence you've ever read? <laughs> you've got all kinds of affliction, severe affliction, the testing of it, of their faith. You've got extreme poverty. You've got it overflowing because of joy with wealth of generosity. Isn't that? I just love that. For they have given according to their means, and I can testify, beyond their means of their free will. Of their free will. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in this offering for the saints. It just is the most wonderfully rich passage about giving. Now let's skip down a little further, starting at verse 9. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. So this matter about giving and growing in the grace of giving. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the willingness to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what you don't have. This is the beauty of the passage that we are going to look through today about giving. So last Sunday, we started into this four-part series. We started with the heart. You know, before you ever get to the wallet, you got to start with the heart. You start there because it has to be a heart that has been touched and set free by the grace of Jesus. His forgiveness, his love, his power, his mercy, his compassions fail not. The heart must be touched by the grace of Jesus before it will open up the floodgates of generosity. This is all responsive. Even the language that we use of tithing is responsive in its nature. It's not about the tithe. It is about the responsiveness to the grace of God in your life. That's what it's about. And so the tithe really is only a place to start. It's not meant to be the end all for the believer. So this morning, we want to look at how grace affects your will. Now, in our culture, we speak of the will as part of our mind. That's how we describe. The will is in the mind. You make decisions in the mind. But in the scriptures, in that culture, the heart was the place where the will is. But either way, don't be confused by it because it is the seat of decision making. It's where you make your decisions. So we are diving a little deeper this morning. Are you ready? You got your snorkel on, you're going to go down a little deeper. All right, so we're going to go a little deeper and we're going to take a look at this area of decision making, especially as it relates to giving, but in general, in the whole Christian life as well. This willingness is an essential ingredient. So biblically, when the Greek talks about willingness in the New Testament, it talks about an eager disposition, sort of ready and willing. You just give me a target, launch me off. That's what it's about. You put something in front of me, I'm there, I'm going. So it's this eagerness, this desire, this willingness to see God move. 
And it's a very important ingredient in our Christian lives, full stop. Sin has tragically, it's wounded us here in this very area. Sin has put into us what was otherwise a healthy inclination towards God and the things of God. Sin has come and corrupted us so that God has been changed to us. Selfishness is where our inclinations now roam freely. So outside of God's mercy, outside of his grace, the inclination of the heart, according to the scripture, is evil all the time. Ooh. You don't get Mondays off. It's evil all the time. In fact, if you study the scripture, you find in Genesis chapter 6, when God destroyed the world in the flood, saving Noah and his family, this is the reason that is given. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of man was on the earth, and every inclination of his thoughts in his heart are evil all the time. So what we end up then is we end up with this sort of twisted sense of desire, this twisted sense of willingness, this inclination, and it goes to kind of a commercial sense. It's measured in loss or gain. So in other words, I now make choices based on what I get out of it. How is it gonna help me? What's it gonna do for me? How is the situation gonna benefit me? So instead of saying, well, how's it going to bless God? How's it going to help God? How's it going to work with God? We twist it and we turn it towards ourselves. That's what sin does. So we need help, right? Because how else do we break this? How else do we change the inclination of our hearts? It has to be an act of grace. It has to come from Jesus. I'm going to explain that as we go through, but basically here's a prayer from the Old Testament. So before Jesus was on the picture, had come to this earth, had died for our sins, had raised from the dead, offering us new life, and when we believe, he comes into us, pours his grace into us so that the inclinations of our hearts are changed. Before that could happen, this was a prayer from the psalmist in Psalm 51, verse 6. The Lord desires truth in the innermost being. That's where he wants truth to reign. Not the deceptions that come from our inclinations. So we pray, Lord, put this in here. And he goes on to say, and the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. So in the places that no one else can see except him, he wants to put in there wisdom. So that the inclinations are for him. And when they're for him, they're for good. And when they're for good, everybody gets blessed, including the giver. Amen? But the inclination has to change. Paul talked about this. This is not an easy walk. In Romans chapter 7, Paul used this as a way of describing this battle that goes on for the inclinations of your heart. In Romans 7, he says, "For For in my inner being I delight... In God's law. I know deep inside myself that God's law is perfect. It's good. It's just. I know deep in there it is. But, he says, something happens. But I also see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to sin and the working of its members in my body. So I've got this battle going on in my mind, as Paul says, it's a war for what is right, for the inclination of my heart to be moved in the right direction. He goes on to say, what a wretched man I am. (laughs) You know, he looks at himself in the mirror, the spiritual law, and he goes, what a mess I am. But then he finishes with this, listen carefully, thanks be to God. Someone can rescue me from this. His name is Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? You see, he can come and rescue. He is the rescuer. And he wants to rescue us from our own inclinations, the one that destroy us. 
We think we're making good choices, but those choices will destroy us. They will capture us. In fact, Bill and I were talking about this earlier. It actually is the essence of being addicted. Is it comes in and it takes that, that willingness to change, to not do those things, and it just craps you. And the only way out is through willingness to change. It's got to come from your will. And of course, Jesus comes and gives us the power to do that change. That's where it comes from. Amen? Amen. All right. So this is foremost in the mind of Jesus. Now, when he was here, Jesus walked this earth doing many miracles, right? He did many things. He taught many things, did many miracles. But what was he looking for? He was looking for the will, the willingness to believe in him. That's what he was after. In fact, there's a wonderful story where Jesus chastises the Pharisees, the religious people, the ones who should have known better. This is what he says in John chapter 5, verse 39. He says, you have searched the scriptures. So these Pharisees, they knew their Old Testament, backwards, forwards, inside out, upside down. They knew it. They knew the scriptures because you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, Jesus says. Here you are searching away, looking for life, looking for eternal life. And really what they're doing is they're testifying about him. And then he said these words, listen carefully, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you can have life. Our willingness makes all the difference right there. Our willing, our want to, our want to. There's another great story in the book of John, just a little bit after, uh, before this rather, in the same chapter, John 5. It's a story of Jesus doing his normal thing, walking around, healing people. <laughs> and he gets up to Jerusalem, and he goes to this area just outside the temple called the Sheep Gate. And uh, there's a whole bunch of lame people there, a whole bunch of paralyzed people, blind people. And uh, he walks around, and he comes to this one fella who's been lying there 38 years. 38 years. That's a long time. Would you agree with me? That is a long time. It's easy to read, but hard to imagine. And what did Jesus ask him? In verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for such a long time, he went and he asked him, Do you want to get well? Now, you might think that's a dumb question to someone who's been lying on the ground for... 38 years, and he responds, well, Lord, yes, I, I want to get in because apparently this is how they saw it. There was a moving of the water, and he would want to get to that pool, but he had to rely on others to get him there, and, and it was never in time. He could never get there in time. What was he saying to Jesus with that answer? I'm willing, but I can't get there. And Jesus looked at him and said, get up. I love it. He didn't explain much. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Pooh! And man, it, the, what once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked away. Hallelujah. You see, what he was looking for, of all those people lying there, all the lame, all the shame, he picked this one to give us a lesson. And what is the lesson? Do you want to give? Oh, sorry. Do you want to be healed? Because really, that's the question. That's the ultimate question for this man and for all of us. Do we want to do what God wants? Do we want God to work in our lives? Do we want him to set us free? We come by faith and say yes. Do we want him not only to set us free, but do we want him to work in how we live? Yes then what's the rule book say? The rule book says, give. That's it. Freely you have received. Freely give. Freely give. That's how you walk in the Christian faith, by giving. Because it goes against our natures. 
Our natures are against giving. Unless somehow you're going to be looking good in it. Then they'll do it. But that's our nature. And Jesus comes, he breaks it, and he asks us, do you want to be free? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to give? And watch what I can do with your giving. I've always wondered about the little boy. Isn't that a great story? He comes to Jesus with his five loaves, two fishes, and he gave them to Jesus. And it doesn't say anything about his wanting to or anything. In fact, it even says the disciples took it. But when Jesus got a hold of that, he fed thousands of people. Was it hard for him to, did he struggle with that miracle? No, he just prayed. And he began to break it. And it fed thousands upon thousands. He's looking for our willingness. In fact, there are stories, plenty, that provide the exact opposite experience. When Jesus came to his hometown, do you remember that story? He comes to his hometown, he preaches, everybody's like, wow, this guy can really teach. But then something happens. They started asking questions. Where did this man get this wisdom and this miraculous power? Isn't this just the carpenter's son? You know what they were doing? They were talking themselves out of wanting to believe. You know, we can do that too, can't we? We can talk ourselves out of wanting to believe. And so what happened? Well, it says very clearly that Jesus could do very few miracles there because of their lack of faith. Isn't that something? They talk themselves out. Do a little check in your mind. Just sitting right here right now. I'm with you on this, so it's not about just, you know, you. It's me too. How often do you talk yourselves out of what God wants for you? How often do you do that? How many excuses do you have lying around handy? Oh, I could never do that. Oh, that's just not me. Oh, that's just too embarrassing. What if they don't like me? What if something happens and I offend somebody? It says here that they took offense at Jesus when he did that, when he stood up in front of them. Because they had talked, they were wowed, yes, but they were unwilling at the end. This is Jesus' hometown. Another wonderful story of a woman who comes into a Pharisee's home. Jesus gets invited. Come to my house, the Pharisee says. You know, it's like hoity-toity stuff. You know, if I have this amazing teacher at my house, woohoo! So he has this amazing meal. Right near the beginning of the meal, this woman, who is from the streets, so we're left to imagine she's a prostitute. She wanders into the meeting. She wanders into the meal. So in those days, they would recline. You know, they would put an elbow in a pillow. Have you seen the pictures where their feet are out to the edge and they're each sort of leaning in on a pillow and they're eating this way? This is how they did it. And so she comes up and behind Jesus, she starts to cry. And she starts to cry so much that her tears wash his feet. Well, then she thinks, oh, what am I going to do? So she takes her hair, she undoes her hair, and she dries Jesus' feet with her hair. This is not a brothel, okay? This isn't a table where you do that stuff. This is a Pharisee's home, for goodness sake. There she is crying, wiping his feet, and she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. It must have been costly. And so she realizes what's happening, and she breaks the jar, and she pours it on his feet and rubs it in very tenderly. This Pharisee is losing his mind, and he thinks to himself, if Jesus really knew who it was that was doing this to him, he wouldn't allow it. And so Jesus says, <laughs> he answers his thoughts. Isn't that something? All right, so here he is thinking this, but well, maybe his face was showing it too. Probably, but Jesus answers his thoughts. This is what he says. Simon, I have something I want to say to you. And he said, well, say it, teacher. <laughs> Preach it, brother. He maybe thought he was going to condemn this until he started saying it. 
Say it. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 bucks, the other owed 50. When they were both unable to pay, the generous, gracious forgiver uh, man forgave them both. So which one of them will show more love? Well, Simon says, I suppose it's the one who he forgave more. Jesus turned and said, you've answered correctly. And then he, he applies it. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see her? <laughs> the, one of the dumbest questions of scripture. But also one of the smartest. Do you see her? This is what his illustration is. I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. This was customary. This was a dusty, dirty place. Everybody wore sandals. It was customary to have water to wash the feet, even to have a servant to do it. You, I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. What's the difference? What's the difference? Hmm. You gave me no kiss, which was customary again. Especially when you have a rabbi come to your house. You give a kiss out of respect. Not on the lips, on the cheek, just in case you need a direction. <laughs> You gave me no kiss, but since I've come in here, she has not stopped kissing my feet. What's the difference? What's the difference? You did not anoint my head with oil, which was customary. Everybody stunk. Come on, walking through the markets. When you lie at a table, you put a little fragrance on there, hey, a little oil, just to make it smell beautiful. She, she anointed my feet with her perfume. What's the difference? I ask you, what is the difference? A willingness. A willingness. That Pharisee didn't want to do that because that would show too much honor, that woman couldn't wait to do that. Even though she risked being kicked out of the house for her actions, she wanted to anoint those feet. And Jesus turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. And she was given new life. Hallelujah. New life comes when we want to give. Willingness is essential. So, as it relates to giving, I want to go through those passages again. Oh, before I do that, I want to say this last thing before I go into those passages again. In the Old Testament, God has provided the most amazing motivation to give, to grow in giving. You know what it is? Here it is. Every other place in the scriptures, it is denounced that you should not test the Lord your God, right? Hello? Do not test them. Don't be presumptuous with this. Except for one thing and one thing only. What is it? Giving. Giving. So he pumps up the motivation here. This is what he says in Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house for everybody. Test me in this. Say that with me. Test me in this. Come on, say it like you mean it. Test me in this. It's the only place where God says, test me. Have some fun with me. You see if you can outgive me, I'll beat you every time. Test me. Come on. I've had a few bullies try to pull that one on me. You know, come on, test me. And sometimes I won, and most of the time I lost. <laughs> but the test was there. Come on, test me. And God wants us to know his blessing. Look what he finishes with. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't have any room for it. You know what happens when you don't have room for blessing? 
It's everybody gets the rest. Everybody gets the leftovers. Everybody gets the rest. You can't contain it. You can't control it. It's out there in the open. God wants to bless us. And he wants you to test him in this blessing. He wants you to willingly give, not out of compulsion, not because the preacher screams at you, give more. No, that is the wrong way to go about it. It's like shouting at someone, live out more love, will you? It doesn't work. (laughs) It's about that willingness. It's about that longing. Look what happened. First, he uses the Macedonians. Look what they did. Remember what I said? The test of severe affliction, the extreme poverty, and the joy in their hearts. Well, where did that joy come from, folks? From the Lord Jesus, his grace. And that made them willing to participate. They begged. Like I said last week, it'd be like coming to church with your money in your pocket, and you just can't wait for Pastor Ryan to say, okay, let's take the offering. Woo! I'm on live. I'm alive right now. I want to see what God's going to do. I'm going to throw an extra 20 in there just to see what happens. This eagerness was of their own free will. That's what God wants. When we want to grow in the grace of giving, he wants us to be willing and ready to test him. That was one of the fun things that I got to see my dad do. My dad, he had a game that he played with Jesus over giving. And he would frequently say, you can't outgive him. You just can't. Hmm. I had good, I had a good education there watching that happen. And I remember very, it's like it was yesterday. I remember him saying to me, Kevin, you know that granary out there full of canola? I want you to go get the truck and fill it. We're going to take it to the mill, and then we're going to take the check to the church. It was like 20 grand at that time. I'm like, what? Did I learn something that day? And the sparkle in my dad's eyes. It wasn't me. It wasn't for me. It was because he was excited to see what God was going to do. It was a game. It was fun to him to test God with his generosity. Hallelujah. So, Dad, if you're watching, thanks. This is, this is so important. This is the backbone of giving. The heart is where it starts, right? You start here, touched by grace, but the willingness must be there. And I got to ask you the same question Jesus asked the man beside the pool. Do you want to give? Or better phrased, do you want to try out giving God? <laughs> That's where the action is. That's where the action is. Well, we struggle with this. And as it says here in, in the second part where he talks to the Corinthians, he's, he's trying to pick at their willingness. Uh, he says in verse 11, now you started this thing last year, so finish the work so that your eager willingness to do will be matched with your completion of it according to your means. <laughs> For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. I, I just think this is wonderful. So what he's trying to say to them is this. Willingness must be matched with action. You you must take a step of faith. You must reach into your pocket, pull out your wallet, open it up, look at it, see what's there, and say, all right, here's what I would normally give. Let's see if I give this much what happens. It has to be an action completed. And so this is the whole thing that Paul is writing about here. He says, you know, your willingness is great, but follow through with action. Act on your willingness. Otherwise, it's just this. Talk, and talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. But action costs. That's the demonstration 
of their willingness. The action. Faith without deeds is dead faith, Paul James said. Listen, this is how he says it. The Lord Jesus himself, you know his grace. Though he was rich, king of heaven, he became poor, came to this earth as a humble servant, that you might become rich. Philippians 2 says it this way. This is God's nature. This is God's nature. That Jesus, though he was with God and was God, did not think that by force, this is some helpful translation, that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took on the nature of a servant. He is our example of a willingness. He wanted to come and fix this. From that moment those words were ushered from God when he said to Eve, who had betrayed him, I am going to bring somebody through your womb, down the line through your womb, that will set this right, that will turn the enemy upside down, that will crush his head. So right from way back then, the willingness of God to do this It even says that before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. Even before that, he was willing. That's the kind of God we serve. This is how God wants us to give. I love that it says, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. It does not matter how much you give. Get that out of your head. It comes from the willingness to test God. That's where the action is. How it comes out, it's almost as though he says, I don't care, as long as the willingness is there. That's what he'll bless. That's what he'll work with, is that willingness. So it has to do with the will. So it comes from the heart, touched by grace, and the will, touched by grace. I want to give. I want to figure this out. I want to test God in this. I want to have a little fun with my finances. I want to test him because he invited me to. You're on, God. I'll take up the challenge, the challenge. Let's do it. Now, if you're struggling, you can ask God for help. That's what this war is about. It's a battle. Cry out to him for help. God, help me with this. Help me even in my unbelief. Help me in my willingness, Lord. Help me be more willing to take this risk, to step out in faith, to give more than maybe I should to see what happens. Just to test you, because you said I could. This is what God has in store for us. He did say a couple of things to inspire us. In Ecclesiastes 1, it says, cast your bread on the waters. And this, this is an ancient Hebrew saying, what I would like to say, Kiwis call, give it a go. Give it a go. Chuck your bread out on the water. See what happens. Jesus said, if you do something like this, give, it will be given back to you in good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over. You know that old song? Running over, running over. You know that one, right? The kids sing it. You don't know that one? If you didn't have Sunday school, you probably don't. My, what is it? My heart is full and running over. But as the Lord saved me, I'm as happy as can be. My cup is full and running over. There it is. I had to dig out that one. But he wants you to give. And then he says, now watch. Good measure, pressed down, so it's going to be squished a little to get a little more in. Shaken together, running over, will be poured out on you. In other words, in the Kiwi colloquial word, say it with me. Give it a go. Give it a go. And see what happens. See what happens. He can't wait for you to test him. Let's close in prayer. I invite our worship team to come up and lead us in a final song. Jesus, this has been fun to preach because it's like this, I don't know, this challenge that you've put out in front of us. 
this beautiful word. Test me in this. Come on. Let's go for a journey. Let's go for an adventure. Let's take finances out of this greedy, grubby, selfish heart and let's set it free and see where it goes. And so, God, we just ask right now for those struggling with the inclination, even to answer the question, do I want to give? Jesus, show them by your grace. It can be fun. It can wow them. For those here who are saying, you know, this has been a real encouragement to me. Thank you, Father, for that. The encouragement to give willingly, just to, to have some enjoyment out of this. To even be cheerful, as Pastor Ryan is going to preach next week. Hilarious. It's hilarious. Thank you. So, Lord, that's what we ask for. Help us in our journey to grow in the grace of giving. In your holy name we pray. Amen.